Is it wickedness? Is it deepness? You decide. Are we gonna live or die? Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. As with last month, I'll be running a poll to see which artist I cover next, but I'm gonna be doing something different this time. This poll will not only determine next month's artist, it'll determine the artists for the next three months. So top pick is for August, second pick for September, third pick for October. If you're wondering why it won't cover November and December, it's because I likely won't be doing a dive in December, and I'll be choosing the last artist I cover in November which might give you an idea of who's gonna get covered. In any case, the link to that poll is in the description, and feel free to leave suggestions for artists in the comments. This time, we'll be looking at someone who I think only became a votable option last month and shot all the way to the top. Today, we're talking about Kendrick Lamar. Let's dive in. Kendrick Lamar Duckworth born and raised in Compton, California. He started his musical journey in his teenage years under the name K-Dot, and he released his first mixtape at the age of 16. That mixtape was enough to get him noticed and signed to Top Dog Entertainment, and he put out two more mixtapes under the name K-Dot, including one that was just him rapping over instrumentals from Lil Wayne's The Carter Three. After that mixtape, he decided to drop the stage name and perform just as Kendrick Lamar. It's here where we start our dive proper as we look at his eight main projects so far. Six studio albums, a mixtape, and an EP. And if you're wondering why I'm saying EP like that, it's because this EP is over an hour long. It is literally an extended play. <laughs> and it's a solid one. The production is down-tempo and intimate, being handled by some of the Top Dog crew members like Soundwave. And Kendrick's already a fine lyricist. It's here where we're introduced to many of the themes that Kendrick will grapple with throughout his career. Alcoholism, gang violence, religion, temptation, commercialism. It's a solid EP with solid rapping and solid production, though knowing what will eventually come from the artist formerly known as K Dot, it does feel half-baked listening back to it. But it's, you know, it's his first EP, so it's understandable. This EP led many to consider Kendrick as part of the blog rap sphere and the conscious rap genre, but those are labels that Kendrick would push back against on. A year after the EP dropped, Kendrick released his first mixtape, under his own name. Along with TDE's production, we also saw appearances from his label mates like Absol and Schoolboy Q, along with others like Janae Aiko. And like the EP, it's solid. Definitely clear signs of growth when it comes to production. I like how they took tracks from the EP and brought them back here to flesh them out more. It's also here where Kendrick starts to experiment with manipulating his own vocal delivery, which he will continue to do for the rest of his career. There are some standout tracks on here, but like the EP, Solid production, solid rapping, solid mixtape. It's here where I feel the need to make a disclaimer. From here until present day, I don't think Kendrick has made a bad album. So please keep that in mind if I make certain comments or critiques. I, I say them with confidence because I think all of these albums are at the very least good. With that in mind, Section 80 is great. Quite great, in fact. It's kind of astonishing to see how Kendrick has advanced his craft this far in just two years. The hazy, jazz-influenced production he had been working with is at its best so far here, like on Hold Up and Cushion Corinthians, and certainly Absol's outro. It's also here where you realize just how good of a lyricist Kendrick had become, specifically on tracks like Rigor Mortis. The simple act of hearing him speak syllables can be a joy. Along with his technical craft, Kendrick began creating stories out of his songs. The whole record has a loose concept following two women, Tammy and Keisha, but it's really just a jumping off point for Kendrick to talk about themes like drug abuse, sex work, and questions on morality and mortality. Great record. In October 2012, Kendrick released his major label debut, Good Kid, Mad City. This is the record that took every skill Kendrick had developed thus far and framed them within the context of a full story told over the course of an album. As he puts it on the album art, a short film. Each track has radio-ready hooks aplenty, but when taken together, they told the story of Kendrick finding himself while overcoming corruption, sin, and the cycle of violence in his community. Yep, this sure is considered a great album by so many people. 
I never said I disagreed. It's stellar, absolutely stellar. The technical skill and refined production from Section 80 have only improved, but it's Kendrick's talent as a storyteller with an empathetic eye that makes this record truly great. There are moments where you will get chills listening to the tales that he tells, like on The Art of Peer Pressure or Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst, which might be one of the highlights, if not the peak, of his storytelling capabilities thus far in his entire career. Yet even when you remove the songs from the story, these tracks can pop. Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe, Backseat Freestyle, Poetic Justice, Mad City are all bangers of the highest caliber. While it's not my favorite Kendrick album, I do think that it is the Kendrick album with the best blend of accessible hooks and production, and deep lyrics that can be poured over ages after its release. When people say that this is his best work, I can totally see why. But is it better than The Heist? Also, side note related to the Grammys, do you remember when Kendrick performed Mad City with Imagine Dragons and it was actually pretty damn great? It might be the best thing Imagine Dragons has ever been involved in. Before moving on, I want to touch on a brief but important point in Kendrick's career, his guest appearance on Big Sean's Control. Large Sean put out this song in August 2013 and it featured both Kendrick and Jay Electronica. The song up to Kendrick's verse is fine, and then Kendrick steps up, names about a dozen other artists by name, and um, as a fun little goof, as a fun little joke, threatens to kill them all. It was a verse that dominated hip-hop discourse at the time, and both the album and verse reflected a change in the public's viewing of Kendrick. Before this, he was a good rapper among other rappers. After this, he was the best of his peers. Aside from Macklemore. After touring with Kanye for his Yeezus tour, Kendrick dropped the single I in late 2014, which remains one of my favorite songs by him to date. Put Isley Brothers in everything. Following that, a few months later, was The Black or the Berry, and then the release of To Pimp a Butterfly in May 2015. If you've been watching me for a hot bit, you might already know this, but for those of you who don't, this is not only my favorite Kendrick album, but it's my favorite album of the 2010s. I know, bold take. I'll, I'll take my trophy now. The sheer craftsmanship, musicianship, poetship, I looked that up, that is a word, contained in this album is frankly immeasurable. Good Kid was a great story, but T-Pap is a journey of biblical proportions. Seeing Kendrick fully submerged in a world of sin that is looking to bankrupt him in every possible way. The imagery he conjures on tracks like Wesley's Theory, Black or the Berry, How Much a Dollar Cost, You with him breaking down in the second half, these display Kendrick at his lyrical best. Musically, Kendrick pulls from the West Coast jazz scene with healthy amounts of G-Funk and soul added for good measure, and God, do these tracks bop. Thanks in part to the likes of Thundercat, Soundwave, Terrace Martin, Kamasi Washington, Flying Lotus, Pharrell, Robert Glasper. If there's any criticism I can muster for this, it's more of an acknowledgement of what kind of project this is. Most of this album works in the context of the full experience, so there are fewer tracks on here that work on their own. Anybody else play Mortal Man in full at parties? Anyone? The album version of I is a great example. The song is produced as if it's in a live setting, but it gets stopped by a fight breaking out and Kendrick delivering a spoken word passage. In the album's context, it absolutely works, but it's a bit of a bummer that the single version wasn't incorporated in some way, like as a bonus track. Of course, the massive exception to this is All Right, which became a civil rights anthem during BLM protests around that time. I also want to highlight the TV performances Kendrick did for this album, because they're all amazing. I and Pay For It on SNL, these Walls on Ellen, appearing on one of the last Colbert reports, the Butterfly Medley on Colbert's Late Show, his Grammys performance, and his spot on Fallon. I lost a lot of love for missionary. This the first time I react. Me and Top is like a Kobe you feel. The father figure play with him, you get killed. Man, it would be great if he took the songs he did on live TV and made them into like an album of some kind. If only I were about to transition to that album. If only. You know what, I think some people are gonna be mad at me, but I've just gotta say it. That Bad Blood remix wasn't that bad. I mean, it's not a great track, and it's absolutely not his best work, but there's a certain baseline of quality when it comes to Kendrick, and having a spot on a Taylor Swift song of all things was definitely a boost to his mass appeal. Don't kill a good man's confidence just because he's a nerd and you don't know what brand building is. Anyway, in early 2016, at the behest of LeBron James, Kendrick dropped a collection of outtakes from T-Pab, uh, some of which had only been heard previously from those TV performances I mentioned a second ago. And considering that it's basically Kendrick's amnesiac? 
It's pretty good. Even though they are just outtakes, they have a wholly unique energy to them that separate them enough from Butterfly. This record sounds as if you wandered into a seedy jazz club where the players are just improving for the heck of it. Plus, Kendrick offers a darker, aggressive, more personal take on the themes he brought up in Butterfly. Not only does Untitled stand on its own, I think it also acts as a solid bridge, thematically at least, between T-Pab and... In March 2017, Kendrick dropped the track The Hard Part 4. It, it was a solid track, but what most people took notice of was a line that went, You know what time it is, ante up, this is in forever, y'all got till April the 7th to get y'all together. For all my calendar enthusiasts out there, April the 7th is a date in April. And sucks to be us, we did not get our sandwiches together in time, because Kendrick dropped both lead single Humble and the full album Damn in mid-April. Immediately, this record was considered a classic, melding the aesthetics of both good Good Kid Matt City and To Pimp a Butterfly, while also allowing Kendrick to experiment with song structure, delivery, and contributor selection. U2 is on this thing, and it works. Now that was the reception then. For me, I have feelings about this one. How do I put this? Um, Damn is Kendrick's most personal record thus far. He turns his own insightful eye to himself as he reckons with fame, fortune, sin, pain, loneliness, corruption, and what it means to be Kendrick Lamar Duckworth. A project like that, by its very nature, can often be messy. Not a bad kind of messy, but an inherent one. On one hand, this leads to some of his best songs yet. DNA, loyalty, feel, element, love. I also appreciate both the 24 karat magic sample on loyalty and the hiatus coyote sample on Duckworth. On the other hand, there are tracks on here where I'm just like, what? I will also say, I am not a fan of the mixes on this thing. They're often quite sparse, and there's so much low end that it just feels like it swallows everything else. In addition, I'll quickly mention, there was a theory going around at the time that there was another interpretation of the album to be found if you played it backwards. And they ended up releasing a collector's edition that was the same album, but the track list was reversed. Man, you'd have to be an idiot to buy that. Don't look at me like that, there are mixed differences. But again, I will stress, I still think Damn is always good and often great. Kendrick won a Pulitzer for this. And after having released four quality albums in a row, Kendrick did the unthinkable. He got into comic books. Shortly after the release of Damn, Kendrick was approached by director Ryan Coogler, who had signed on to direct a movie about Marvel Comics character Black Panther. Coogler initially wanted Kendrick to just write a few songs for the movie, but seeing scenes from the film inspired Kendrick to curate an entire album featuring over 20 different artists. In order to get the album out in time with the film's release, most of the songs were completed during the Damn tour. The final product was released a week before Black Panther's release in February 2018. Maybe it's just due to low expectations considering this is a soundtrack album meant to complement and promote a massive blockbuster, but this was pretty enjoyable. Kugler had stated the movie's goal was to explore what it means to be African, and the soundtrack works well in tandem. What Kendrick did here is amass a great cast of black musicians and also James Blake, and since he was given creative control by Marvel and Disney, their vision is uncompromised and uncensored. Except for when they reference DC in Ops, that that's censored and that, that's kind of weird. There are references to the film sprinkled throughout. Kendrick name drops characters every so often. There are elements taken from Ludwig Jorensen's score. But even if you haven't seen the film, this soundtrack stands on its own. Trust me, you don't need to know any lore to understand why Future does the la di da di da bit in King's Dead. Because nobody understands. Black Panther may have been Kendrick's last release so far, but according to reports over the past year, he has been working on a new album. One that's apparently more rock-focused, which can only mean the Kendrick Imagine Dragons collab album that everyone wants, but no matter what he does next, I'm excited to hear it. Over the past decade, Kendrick Lamar has built a reputation as one of the defining musical talents of his generation. These projects I've talked about have allowed Kendrick to weave intricate tales about racial injustice, social inequality, oppression, religion, and what it means to be human today. All the while, he's proven himself capable of creating some of the catchiest, hard-hitting tracks pop culture has seen in ages. If you're looking to get into his work, I mean, you can't go wrong with these four 
at the very least, these two. Feel free to let me know your favorite Kendrick album or song or any other artist you'd like to see covered on the show in the comments. And remember, the poll to vote on the next three artists I cover is in the description, so go check that out. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's an old blind woman outside my window who's looking for something and having a hard time finding it. So I'm gonna go help her out. So um, see you next time. Is it wickedness?